Welcome to the One Human Nation show. I'm the host, Sandy Batiste. Good to be back in the studio. Still recovering from some health issues, but it's good to be back in the recording mode here in the studio. And um, as we start today's show, as a reminder, the viewpoints expressed in the following programs are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or its staff. So the show we're going to talk about today is one that has been kind of on my radar for a while. It just seems to keep popping up because I do believe our youth are our future. My concern is um, there seems to be a higher disparity rate in infant deaths for infant deaths for African American babies, uh, infants, obviously, um, as well as their mothers. So. I took a closer look at this and I found a a recent article, well, recent because it was from this year, February 1st, 2018. And the um, authors of this report, Christina Novia and Jamala, Jamila Taylor, I may be butchering that first name. um, They're the ones that I'm using the report that they printed up. Um, And uh, Christina is a policy analyst for early childhood at the Center for American Progress. And Jamila, Ms. Taylor, is a senior fellow at the same center. So as we start to to look at this, um, one of the things that stood out is they gave some examples um, of people that we may be aware of because of their um, media presence and what they've been involved in. One was a 27-year-old activist that gave birth to her son August 2017. So you may remember the name, Erica Garner. Um, And she was uh, an activist. She was um, very engaged after her father was choked to death by a police officer in 2014. And so that's when she kind of entered the public eye. Um, She suffered her first heart attack, August 2017. And then after um, her father's death, she was also pregnant. And so they feel like the stress of the pregnancy, the the strain of her father's death, um, four months later, she suffered another heart attack, which put her in a coma, which she never woke up from. And she died on December 30th, 2017. So that's a tragic death. And then one of a more of, I guess, a celebrity or a sports professional was actually for Serena Williams. And so this gets into the um, mortality rates of the mothers also. So Serena Williams, after she gave birth to her child, um, she had to get up from her hospital bed and go to the front desk, you know, go to the desk for the nurse's station, say something is wrong. You know, she had a history of blood clots, so she knew something was wrong. But she had to be an advocate for herself because she wasn't getting the attention she needed. So these are two examples of infant mortality rate and um, maternal mortality, mortality rate. And so there's some really good statistics from this report. And it's based on, um, when you take a look at it, it it looks at the international comparisons of non-Hispanic white and African-American women health outcomes. So what they did to access maternal and infant health, they looked at public health researchers and development experts report of the uh, maternal mortality rate, which which is given in deaths per Uh, 100,000 live births. And then the infant mortality rate is the number of infant deaths per 1,000 births annually. So the U.S. mortality rates um, do not compare favorably with other uh, of those other developed countries. And so what they did was take a look at this data. um, And it really showed a very negative impact in both categories categories, maternal and infant mortality rates for African American women. So if you look at all mothers in the United States, um, 14 out of 100,000 live births was the data there. 
For non-Hispanic white mothers, it was at 12.7. For U.S. African-American mothers, it was 43.5 deaths. Uh, Mothers in high-income countries, it was down to 10. And mothers in upper-middle-income countries, it was at 44. So there's definitely a problem here in the United States. So we're going to take a, a deeper look at that. And one of the things that um, I like about the report, it kind of breaks it down into not only given the statistics, it breaks it down into the risk factors. It breaks down poverty and low socioeconomic status, prenatal care, as well as physical health at the time of pregnancy, uh, mental health, um, the cumulative effects of racism, on maternal and infant health. So we've talked about the stress of living in the United States and, you know, as an African-American being aware that you're constantly being judged by the color of your skin. And it's, it's we're, so we're going to talk about some of these issues that um, came up out of this report. Starting with taking a look at the risk factors um, as it looks at as it looks at the most recent research based on poverty and low socioeconomic status. And this is going to tie directly into another show that we're going to be talking about the role of Planned Parenthood and um, the placement in low income areas, as well as the history of the founder. But that's going to be coming up on another show. So when they took a look at poverty and low socioeconomic status, There were numerous studies that show that after controlling for education and socioeconomic status, African-American women retain at higher risk for maternal maternal and infant mortality. So one study showed that after controlling for income, gestational age, you know, the age of the mother, uh, the age of the infant, and maternal age, and health status, the odds of dying from pregnancy or delivery complications were almost, get ready for this, three times higher for African-American women that were from non-Hispanic compared to non-Hispanic white women. And so um, another analysis related to that, controlling for the same factors, showed that college-educated African-American women were almost three times more likely to lose their infants than their similarly educated non-Hispanic white peers. So they also took a look at prenatal care. And, you know, it's kind of a no-brainer that early and adequate prenatal care um, is, you know, should promote healthy pregnancies and reduce the mortality rates. Um, because they're doing maternal health screening, parent education and counseling on healthy behaviors. So although the research showed a lower percentage of African-American women have access to prenatal care than do non-Hispanic women, differences in prenatal care access fail to explain any racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality. In fact, this report goes on to say African-American women who initiated prenatal care in the first trimester still had higher rates of infant mortality than non-Hispanic white women with late or no prenatal care. So they go on to say this may partly be due to different quality of prenatal care. Studies show that once African-American women access prenatal care, it tends to be of lower quality and the women experience more complications. Current health status, health history, stress, and experiences of racism may contribute to maternal and infant mortality when coupled with lower quality prenatal care, and that's according to this report. So they they go on to talk about physical health, physical health. And so some of the obvious behavioral 
interventions often often focus on two behaviors, smoking, drug abuse, actually three behaviors, smoking, drug abuse, and obesity. Neither of these can fully account for the racial disparity in maternal or infant mortality, according to this report. Smoking and drug abuse are risk behaviors that strongly predict preterm delivery, low birth rate, and sudden infant death syndrome. Um, There are several studies, according to this report, that show African-American women are less likely to report smoking cigarettes than are non-Hispanic white women. And I think that's a cultural thing because there's such a stigma attached to smoking when you're pregnant. And there are also no more likely to um, report the abuse of alcohol or drugs during their pregnancy. So that's kind of a cultural difference because of the stigma attached. The other that I thought was very interesting was obesity which is uh, associated with some other pregnancy complications. And it shows that this is more prevalent among African-American women. Um, And then they have this recent study from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene showed that African-American women of normal weight, normal weight, were still at higher risk of dying in the prenatal period than non-African-American obese women. Um, There's a related study, according to this report, comparing mortality rates of of obese African-American and non-Hispanic white mothers show that non-Hispanic white women experience uniformly lower risk. So, you know, we have the higher rates of obesity among African-American women, but it still does not explain the racial disparity. It goes on to talk about mental health. And at this point, I think we're going to do um, a short break so we can make some uh, public service announcements as well as um, station identification and... um, So stay tuned and, you know, hang in there because there is also going to be some positive recommendations from this report and how um, what mental what resources are available for um, uh, medical facilities, medical practitioners that are already in this field of of working with um, pregnant mothers um, and, and, you know, really have a genuine commitment to seeing a reduction in these numbers. And I I do have hope that that does exist. So let's take a break and make some announcements. WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah South. Okay, let's do this. WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. The Telfair Museums will present their annual Juneteenth Family Day celebrating the 153rd anniversary of the end of slavery in the United States on Saturday, June 9th, from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Jepson Center on Telfair Square in Savannah. The event will feature a storyteller, Jamal Touré, art demonstrations, poetry readings, and music. For more information, visit telfair.org. And so as we continue taking a look at our um our this 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 topic that's I know um disconcerting uh it is disconcerting for me I hope it's disconcerting to the viewers also because um if we you know it it's kind of like well if we don't correct the problem in our infants we most certainly can't expect a better outcome in early child care because it just continues to perpetuate itself. Um, 
And there is, um, you know, as, as we talk about the, the other topic that they reference in this report is mental health. And I'm not sure when this is going to air, but there's been several um, high profile women, not necessarily pregnant or uh, but from, you know, committing suicide. Um, so that that's kind of kind of connected because I think there is a connection with women when they especially go through a pregnancy. I can see very easily that uh, depression would be one of those um one of those experiences that they may be having. So when women experience acute, according to this report, and chronic life stressors during pregnancy, maternal health issues can arise. Yet differences in maternal mental health are also not enough to explain the gap in outcomes as African-American women have not consistently reported higher levels of stress during pregnancy. And I can attest to, you know, not being pregnant, but just, you know, it's not something we um, complain about in in the community. And maybe we need to do more of voicing our opinion, but it does get to be tedious because we're, you know, you you say the same thing over and over again and you get the same results, which is indifference or people don't want to hear that you're under stress because you're African-American and of the racism that exists in this country. And they most certainly don't want to hear about, well, you know, because of slavery 400 years ago, there is this residual impact um, because it was 400 years ago. But the reality is we're still dealing with the results of that. And this report goes on to say that women of color are not typically aware of mental health symptoms experienced during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. Um, This is due to lack of knowledge, they're they're stating, regarding the signs and symptoms um, associated with mental health challenges. Uh, Mental health issues among African-American women are largely underreported and symptoms often go under uh, unaddressed. And again, I think this is cultural. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily that African American women are not aware. It's just it's just part of the culture. It's what what we have to deal with on a day to day basis. And when you have to deal with something like that on a day to day basis, you think you're adjusting, but your body is absorbing the stress. And they're going to say that mental health care is often inadequate inadequate to address um, the unique challenges that face women of color, including race and gender discrimination in the workplace and beyond. Um, And these challenges have been linked to depression among this population of African-American women. So, you know, we shouldn't ignore what happens with the mental um, state of African-American women during pregnancy as well as postpartum. Um, And I think that's an ongoing issue for not only the community of African-Americans to address, but also um, medical practitioners dealing with this, this market, dealing with this client base. So, This report goes on to say that the cumulative effects of racism on maternal and infant health, um, the cumulative effects. So what they're stating is that um, research that views maternal risk factors as explanations for racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality often narrowly focuses on women's health during pregnancy. But this approach, according to this report, overlooks an important truth. Healthy, full-term pregnancies and safe labor are more likely to happen when women are physically and mentally healthy before becoming pregnant. In other words, are they are they in their safe place and and physically healthy? Are they getting proper nutrition? Um, there's an alternative approach, and this is coming from this report that's referencing Michael Liu and Neil Halfen, um, that racial dis- disparities reflect altogether different developmental pr- trajectories. 
So that is the social and economic forces of institutional racism set African-American and non-Hispanic white women on distinct life tracks with long-term consequences for their health and the health of their future children. The experience, according to this report from these two gentlemen, the experience of systemic racial bias, not race itself, but racial bias, compromise health. African-American families, for example, according to the report, are offered fewer adequate housing options than non-Hispanic white families, despite being equally qualified when comparing income levels and credit scores, and they are more likely to experience housing instability and eviction. During early childhood, According to this report, African-American girls are more likely than non-Hispanic white girls to live in substandard housing with environmental toxins such as lead that can compromise healthy development. Throughout school, they are more likely to be suspended or expelled than their non-Hispanic white female peers for similar behaviors. And once they enter the workforce, Adult African-American women earn only 63 cents for every dollar earned by white men. And they're more likely than non-Hispanic white men and women to work in jobs that lack structural supports, including flexible scheduling, paid sick days, and paid family leaves. And this report goes on to say that 72% of African-American mothers are single heads of households, leading to increased likelihood of stress. So let's take a little short break and let some of this um, sink in um, as you continue to reflect and digest on this, this information. And if you just tuned in, you're listening to the One Human Nation show. And I think this is a good time to um, um, play the sponsorship for one of our corporate underwriters. And um, let's take a listen to their to their sponsorship. This portion of WRUU LP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by a grant from Brighter Day Natural Foods, offering produce, vitamins, and supplements, and a deli and juice bar. Brighter Day is located at 1102 Bull Street at the south end of Forsyth Park. More information available at 912-236-4703 or brighterdayfoods.com. So if you just tuned in, you're listening to... The One Human Nation Show, and um, we're we're on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. So let's get back to this topic of today, which um, has been disturbing for me, um, but it is, I think, one of those things that we really need to focus on if we're going to be authentic about our continued um, journey through race reconciliation. And so sometimes the topics are painful, 
uh, I guess I should say most of the time the topics are painful. And I, I think that's what I appreciate about WRUU. It provides this opportunity not to just present the rosy picture, but the reality of the world that we live in, no matter how painful it is. And, you know, the focus of the One Human Nation show is what can you do on an individual level? You know, you may not be in the medical field, but you may know somebody in the medical field that you can start asking questions about this. And you can say, hey, you know, I listened to this show um, on WRUU and it was talking about, the, you know, the higher infant mortality rates with African-American women and and kind of, you know, just and, and it's kind of a, if it presents itself, you know, you don't want to bring up the topic at um, a family gathering if this is not even something that um, is appropriate at that time. But typically there's these side conversations going on and, and the opportunity will present itself. And it needs to be done with, you know, n- without judgment. It's just questioning and trying to trying to determine, you know, what what can you do to raise the awareness in your sphere of inf- uh, influence? So this report that we're referencing goes on to state um, about the cumulative effects of racism on maternal and infant health. Um, So they're stating that, you know, there is research that views these uh, maternal risk factors. Um, But the important truth about this, and this is according to the report, healthy full-term pregnancies and safe labor are more likely to happen when women are physically and mentally healthy before becoming pregnant. And they go on to state that the social economic forces of institutional racism um, does have an impact. Um, And one of the things that has an impact on that is the elevated level of the stress hormone cortisol, leading to immune suppression, increasing women's risk of prenatal infections and leading to life-threatening pregnancy and complications. And cortisol um, really plays a role when, um, you know, if you're trying to lose weight and you're, you're, there's that belly weight that you can't seem to get rid of, you know, that could very well be to the increased stress level of that hormone cortisol. So, Um, for African-American and non-Hispanic white women um, that report similar levels of stress during their pregnancies, African-American women's increased exposure to stress throughout their lifetimes increase their probability of having a higher level of this cortisol um, stress hormone, which increases their risk of maternal and infant mortality. So, Given the United States climate of racial inequality, African-American women are more likely to experience stress during sensitive periods in early life and to be chronically exposed to stress. So this report goes on to say that teen mothers, which I found to be very interesting, that African-American teen mothers have lower infant mortality rates than African-American mothers in their 20s. Since the births of young mothers are generally associated with poor health outcomes, this was a surprising finding from this report. And I think it's because they're not aware as teen mothers what they're getting into. You know, and once you're in your 20s, I think you're more awake, you're more aware. So this report goes on to say uh, about social environmental risk factors. So they point out, and this is kind of a summary of what we've been talking about, substandard housing and housing instability, concentrated poverty, neighborhood safety, air quality and environmental stresses, poor access to quality foods and adequate nutrition, poor access to quality, comprehensive health care services, unequal educational opportunities, poor employment opportunities, including lack of access to flexible scheduling and livable wages, disproportionate police violence. So, This report goes on to state that 
there are problems in the healthcare institutions that may be um, deepening the racial disparities. But they they do go on to to point out that there may be um, more opportunities for these healthcare practitioners to per, you know to participate in unconscious bias training because you know as we talk about on the One Human Nation show it's our unconscious bias that has an impact on how we implement and how we engage uh, with people. And if you're in the position of, of writing policy or setting policy, I think it's very critical, whether you're in the medical profession or not, that you're conscious of your um, unconscious bias. Um, so here are some promising developments that this report um, talks about. This is the good news. There are advocacy movements such as Black Mamas Matter Alliance and the National Birth Equity Collaborative. Um, so they have joined with federal, state, and local leaders to share lessons learned through the Alliance for Innovation in Maternal Health and the Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Networks Addressing Maternal and Infant Health. And I thought it was interesting that these entities are um, funded through the Health Resources and Services Administration. Uh, in other words, they're receiving um, government um, funding. So here are some recommendations. Here are some positive um, news um, that uh, this report is recommending. So number one, conduct research that substantiates the connections between a mother's health before, during, and between pregnancies as well as that of her child across the life course. Number two, conduct comprehensive nationwide data collection on maternal deaths and complications with data um, disaggregated, in, in other words, aggregated by race, geography, and social economic status. Number three, produce data sets that include informational, social, environmental risk factors for women and infants of color. Number four, conduct better assessments and analysis on the impact of overt and covert racism on toxic stress and pregnancy-related outcomes of women and infants of color. Number five, conduct research to identify best practices and effective interventions, interventions for improving the quality and safety of maternity care. Number six, conduct research to identify best practices and effective interventions as well as health outcomes before and during pregnancy in order to address pre-disease pathways of adverse maternal, maternal and infant death. And last but not least, number seven, conduct research to identify effective interventions for addressing social determinants of health disparities and maternal and health outcomes. And so one of the things that I do just kind of want to, if you're wondering why, you know, housing um, and, and what, what contributes to that, if someone's getting notification that their rent's going to be increasing, they're more likely to move. And we, we know moving is a stressor in itself. And if they have kids um, already that are of school age, that also impact those kids because they're probably going to be changing school districts. So that's all stress. It's stress in the family. It's stress for that parent um, that's dealing with, you know, um, having other children in the household that are also being um, impacted. So as we wrap up today's show, I'd I like to, you know, really commend Christina Nova, Novia and Jamila Taylor on, on this particular report. It was definitely an eye-opener for me, and I hope it was also an eye-opener for you. Um, as we get ready for um, the um, Troy Stoner coming up with Sound Limits, I do want to let you know the email address has a change as far as how to connect with the One Human Nation show. The, he the email address now is one human nation w r u u at gmail dot com. That's 
One Human Nation, W R U U at gmail.com. I'll also be changing the website so you won't be able to connect with the um, existing website now. I'm going to be going with um, also doing more blogging to kind of announce the shows and uh, make it a little bit easier for you to follow. But the podcast will continue, um, and that's either through iTunes or you can connect through Podbeans if you're um, not um, connected on iTunes. Again, thanks for listening to the One Human Nation show. I hope you have a blessed week and continue on your journey towards uh, race reconciliation and what you can do with your sphere of influence. Thanks for listening and have a great week.